John chapter 19. John 19. Thirty-one. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Lord, bless this book. In your name I pray. Amen. You can be seated. This is a great day. This is the first day of unleavened bread. All of these feast days point to Christ. It is no coincidence that he died on the Passover. And the Passover, of course, was the beginning of months with Israel. God said, this is how you're going to keep time. And so the Lord Jesus Christ dies on Passover. But what follows is the Feast of First Fruits and the Feast of, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, Pente uh, Pentecost that comes 50 days later. The Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Feast of First Fruits are brought together. But here's something that's very important about this. It's remarkable. The day that Christ was crucified was a Passover day. Okay? He was the Passover lamb. The next day was a Sabbath, and the next day was a Sabbath, and the next day was a Sabbath, and the next day was a Sabbath. Well, two days after he was crucified, the Feast of First Fruits shows up in the, uh, in the Sabbath days. And if you'll count the Passover and then one, two, what does that give you? That gives you three days. And the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, is the first fruits of them that slept. So this is, fits perfectly in the prophecies of God, not just any time, but the Passover. And the Bible says here that he was, uh, that they besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might that they might be taken away. But when they came to him, he was gone already. And the reason he was is because he dismissed his spirit. He said, I have life. He said, I have power to take it up, and I have power to lay it down again. And that, of course, is exactly what it did. he did. If his life had been taken from him, that meant that someone had power over him and power over his life, and they did not. He did not give up that power. The Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 22, If a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be uh, to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God, that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So when the Lord Jesus died on the cross, and I believe it was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, because about 9 o'clock in the morning is when he was nailed to the tree. He was on there for six hours. He passed away, gave his life at 3 in the afternoon, and that's when he said, it is finished, and, and the salvation was done. And it, the Bible says that he, Deuteronomy 21 he that is hanged is cursed of God. You do a little search on it, and you'll find out that's the first time the word cursed, a curse now, not curse, but a cursed shows up in the Bible. And it has to do with hanging someone up on a tree. This is a curse. This is, this is the Lord Jesus Christ taking our curse. The apostle says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now this is important. This is, what we, this is high theology I'm giving you. Let's take a comparison. If you look at the book of James, the book of James is a wonderful book, but it's a practical book. It doesn't get into theology like this. The book of James has to do with if you don't work, then you don't have any faith. But show me your works. Show me your faith by your works. The book of James says you have not because you ask not. You ask amiss to consume it upon your own lust. The book of James talks about a man who hires people to come into the field and he doesn't pay, he doesn't pay them. Rich folk were the same 2,000 years ago as they are today. Remember this, rich men write the laws. So this is the book of James. It's a very practical book. But what you're dealing with in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 is heavy-duty stuff. For he hath made him to be sin for us, 
who knew no sin. Why? Because he was accursed of God. When you look at the cross at Calvary, you look at justification. It is there that a man can be justified from his sin. You look at righteousness. You look at the very righteousness of God. God's righteousness at first is what matters. Is he righteous? Sure he's righteous. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? And he was righteous in allowing his son to die on the cross. Why? Because his son had become sin for us who know no sin. When I look at the cross at Calvary, I see redemption. For the Lord Jesus Christ became the Goel that you read about in the book of Ruth, the kinsman redeemer. By taking flesh upon himself, becoming one of us, he was qualified, qualified now, to save us through that as our kinsman redeemer. So redemption was taking place at the cross. I see holiness at the cross. I see a separation take place that cannot be matched anywhere else at any time. There's only one Calvary. And that's what holiness is about. It's about separation, 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 separation. In the book of Isaiah chapter 6, when that cherubim, when that seraphim rather, had those coals, he cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You can be certain that you know the Lord Jesus Christ when the Spirit in you, the Spirit of Christ that dwells in you, begins to pull you away from the crowd that's dying in this world. Amen. This is, called, this is what's called sanctification, separation, holiness, is to separate you. At the cross at Calvary, I see propitiation. What is that? That's where God is satisfied. A propitiation takes place. The anger of God is appeased. The propitiation is a payment involved. And when I look at the cross, I see salvation. Soter is the Greek word for it. Salvation comes in many different forms. But the first thing that happens to you if you're born again is that your soul is saved and your spirit is born again. And then from that moment on, he sets about to save your life. And that saving your life is to give you life on this earth and testimony and witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Get out of here, bug. <laughs> Amen. Go eat on somebody else. But this is what happens. He had, uh, he had uh, salvation. Then there was pardon and forgiveness at the cross at Calvary. Think about this. You're not forgiven for your works. You're not forgiven for your race. You're not forgiven for who you belong to, what you've done. Your forgiveness is completely and absolutely based upon the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Then, preacher, you seem to be telling me that the, that the cross of Calvary is the center point of everything. Yes, it is. And if it doesn't point to the cross, it points to hell. I don't care how religious it is, for there is no salvation outside the cross of Christ. And at the cross we see love. We see the love of God. He gave himself for us. How shall not he that freely gave his own son also give us great many things? And he certainly will. God's for you, not against you. And then at the cross I see where God made peace with man. If you'll notice the book of Revelation, it talks about the wrath of the Lamb the wrath of the Lamb. The Lord Jesus Christ bought that authority by giving himself for us at the cross. And so therefore God the Father has, has handed over a peace, peace, making peace with mankind and says, I have made peace with you, you make peace with me. And that's the, and that's the message of reconciliation that we preach. So the cross is a big deal, folks. It's a very important thing. And the Apostle Paul says, I come unto you, the church at Corinth, knowing nothing but Christ and him crucified. And a lot of people would like to leave him on the cross. He's not on the cross. A lot of people would like to take the cross and turn it into some kind of religious object where it's just, you know, some of the decoration or what have you. No, I've got a cross right here because to me, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ is everything. And if I don't preach that cross, it's time for me to hang up and leave to know nothing among you to look at the bible and look at every verse of scripture through the lens of the lord jesus christ everything everything now his life extended past what happened at the cross but it was at the cross where he was your savior redeemer and righteousness and justification and all of that so he was cursed of god in Luke chapter 23, verse 15, behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. Now, if you notice carefully the qualifications of this man, Luke 23, verse 50, 
it says he was a good man. And it says he was a just man. In plain words, he was an Israelite like uh, Nathaniel. He was an Israelite in whom was no guile. He was living the faith that of fathers of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He was like Simeon and Anna who praised the, the birth of the Lord when he was brought to the temple. We find them. The, there are many of them. And like 7,000 that haven't bowed their knee to Baal, we read about in 1 Kings. So here we read about Joseph of Arimathea. He was a just man and had not consented to the counsel and deed of them. And he was of Arimathea, city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. This man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone wherein never man before was laid. I've been privileged to go to the garden tomb. I cannot guarantee to you that that is the tomb that Christ was laid in, but a lot of things around there coordinate with each other to make you think it very well could be, for there's a huge cistern underneath. There's, a, there's Golgotha within a stone's throw of it. The British will take you through a wonderful tour of the, of the garden tomb, and they'll give you the scriptures in chronology, in time, and they, and, they, and they keep it beautiful, flowers and everything. And the British do an, do an outstanding job. So if you ever do go to the Holy Land, you know, you'd want to go to the garden tomb. And so uh, this is what we're talking about here. The Bible said he took his body, and what we have now is the body of Jesus. Notice carefully, the body of Jesus. He took it down, wrapped it in linen, laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. And that day was the preparation the Sabbath drew on. And the women also which came with him from Galilee followed him and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. So they're witnesses. They're watching. They're curious. They want to know where he's taken. They want to know where his body was taken. So they follow them. And here they are. They watch it. And of course, on that early Sunday morning, that's where they came. They came to the very spot where they had seen his body laid to, to, laid to rest. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. The Sabbath day has never changed. The Sabbath day is uh, Saturday. That's the Sabbath. The, the, the Muslim, when he, uh, Muhammad, uh, produced his scriptures in 600 A.D., uh, they knew that the Christians worshipped on Sunday, and they knew the Jews worshipped on Saturday. So they said, well, we're going to find our own day. So what did they do? They took Friday. And if you keep up with it, you'll find the Muslims pray on Friday. That's not the only day they pray, but that's a special day to them. So why do we recognize the first day of the week? Why is that important to us? Because it's the day he arose from the dead, that's why. It's the beginning of the week. It's the first day of the week, and that matches it's the start of a week. It's the start of something new. And the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead. So the Bible says uh, in, uh, in, uh, it, they had taken him to a garden tomb. Now Matthew says this, Matthew 27, 33, And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, Golgotha, the word itself means skull. Now, there was a strong Jewish tradition that Shem took Adam's skull and buried it at this place called Golgotha. The word itself means skull. And so therefore, because his, his, his skull was buried there, it became a, <coughs> a notable sight. If you'll notice now what the writer says, when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, and he, and he interprets it for you. That is to say, a place of a skull. It was the place of a skull. So the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified at a place called a skull. Now some of the old rabbis teach also that that place where Shem supposedly buried the skull of, uh, of Adam, that it's the center of the earth, center of the earth. Now you can do a little research into it and you'll find a lot of different takes on it and, it not, and they don't necessarily agree with each other. Just like you're talking to some people say, what's the greatest country on earth? Well, the Frenchman will say France. 
Englishmen will say England. Uh, Spaniards will say Spain, so forth and so on. But I do know this. I do know that just in the last few days in France, remember them, the French, the French Rebellion, all right? The French Republic, Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette, you remember all of that? Well, the French now have come out and said that this business of transgenderism, the idea that you don't know what your gender is and that you are what you claim to be, is to, uh, just to paraphrase them, idiocy. It's ignorant. And so they're not very woke over there in France, are they? <laughs> no. I appreciated that. I really did. I appreciated them make a statement like that. So uh, what we have here at this Golgotha, and if this is true, that the head of Adam, the skull of Adam, was buried at this place, and therefore it became notable as the place of the skull, then there's an obvious connection with the Lord Jesus Christ because he's the second, or he's rather the last Adam and the second man. Yes, that's very possible. Now I want you to look at Luke chapter 24 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Now it, upon the first day of the week, that is Sunday, first day of the week, Sunday, very early in the morning, probably before sunrise, they came to the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. Now, can you imagine this little group? All they had was a body now. That's all they had. And they didn't even have that because the body was in a tomb. So, you know, it wasn't their personal possession. They had to get to it. And you know, I understand, of course, that the Romans set a guard. And when the Romans set a guard, that's guard. These men are there at the pain of death because if they failed in their job and their duty, they'd be put to death. So when the Romans set a guard, they meant they had a guard. And the Bible says, very in the morning, the sepulcher brings spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. So what happened? Well, the angel of the Lord showed up. And when the angel of the Lord showed up, the guards, my dear friend, are nothing but human beings. They're nothing but men. And the angel of the Lord rolled the stone away. He didn't roll it away for the Lord to come out. He rolled it away for them to get in. The stone may very well be at the church of Madaba. Madaba's on top of the mountain, and I've told you about that church and told you about their mosaic floor. And they say, and they've got a round, they've got a big round stone. They say that that is the very stone that was in front of the garden tomb. Now here's a fact. When you go to the garden tomb, you'll see there's no stone, and the stone is gone. And so therefore it gives them, you know, they conjecture that they have that stone. Now why is it important? Because Moses was there, that's why. Because it's, it's the top of the mountain. It's where Moses saw the promised land. It's top of Nebo. And there they have the church of Madaba. And they say this stone, and they've got it. Just do, Google it when you get home, and you'll see a stone that's supposed to be, it's round, has to be round to roll and fit in that channel. And so maybe it is. Who's to say it's not? I certainly don't know. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. They entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Do you know why they didn't find his body? Because he wasn't in his body dead. There wasn't a dead body lying there. He was in his body alive. Amen. It's no, long, it's no more body time. Now it's living time. You see, you got religion all through this. It's quite remarkable. Look at it. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout. They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to say. They were completely confused. Now, if they'd stopped and taken a breath... They'd have thought, well, you know, he said that to destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. If they'd really done some thinking into it, they'd realize the Lord Jesus had already told them that he was going to rise from the dead. This is not something he told them later. He said to the two on the road to Emmaus, old fools and slow of heart to believe. And so they're confused <coughs> because they're simply doing what anybody would do that's following their senses and their physical sight. And that's what gets us in trouble because your senses and your physical sight aren't necessarily faith. 
And he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith. God honors faith. And so the Bible says, came to pass as they were much perplexed. Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, you notice what they did? You notice what they did to the angels? They did to the angels like others did to angels. They fell down to worship them. They put their face down to the earth. Why? Because an angel is a beautiful, shining uh, uh, creature that uh, it has glory, glory emanating from it. And if you don't know, then you find people falling down and they had their faces to the earth. But here's what the angels say, because in every case it will always be this way. It was like when they fell down before the apostle Paul. Paul said, get up, I'm like you. Peter, get up, I'm one of you. Said here, why seek ye the living among the dead? Well, that's good. Have you ever been in the dead church? You ever been around dead religion? Let me tell you how to find out dead religion when you're around it. Dead religion doesn't give glory to God and victory through Christ. Dead religion is all about you and the way you feel. Dead religion always focuses on the person and not the Lord Jesus. That's the first sign of dead religion. And keep that in your mind. Dead religion will not give glory to God and lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He's not here, but is risen. Now, that's the time to take a shouting spell. That's the time for them who were so confused to say to themselves, what a fool I've been. He told us he was going to do that. He was going to rise from the dead. But that's the time for me to say to you tonight that if Christ is not risen from the dead, then we're dead. We're dead. We're just as dead as this huge graveyard behind us with no hope, and our loved ones are gone, and you'll never see them again. And that's, the, and that's all this world has to offer you out here. So let's look at it for a moment. Oh, sure, they can give you some pleasures of sin for a season. Sure, they can. And, and you watch them. They're always keeping their mind occupied. They've got to be doing and doing and doing and partying and partying and partying and pleasure and pleasure and pleasure. And why do they do that? Because the flesh is telling them every day they live, this is one less day of your life. You better get all you can in this life. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. That's the philosophy of the world, folks. And I'm afraid that that's the philosophy of a lot of churches. Is Christ risen from the dead? You really believe it? Well, of course you do. I do. I firmly believe it. How do you know that, preacher? Because he hath given to me the earnest of the Spirit. He gave me the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah to God. The Holy Ghost moved into my soul. I didn't know any theology. I could, probably couldn't even name the books of the Bible, all of them. I knew a few, knew a few stories out of the Bible that I've been taught in Sunday school. But I'll tell you one thing. When the Holy Spirit moved into my soul and saved me and I was born again, I knew it. Now, I want you to think about that tonight. What kind of comfort does that bring to you? See, that's the earnest, the earnest. That's the down payment. That's the promissory note. That's, that's him telling you, I've given you a taste of heaven. This is a taste. This is something that you can latch on to. Now, religious people don't have that. Oh, they'll say, I believe everything you believe, but well, then why aren't you born again? Neither cometh they to the light because their deeds were evil. I'm going to tell you why you're not born again. You're not born again because you don't really want to be born again. You're not willing to exchange the pleasures of sin for a season in the land of the dying when you could come into the land of the living. Is Christ alive then? Oh, yes, he lives. Yes, he lives. How do you know he lives, preacher? Because he's alive in me when he came into me in 1973. Did he come into you? Yes. See? He came into you. Now, where'd you get that from? How many of you had the Lord Jesus come into you before you ever knew I was on this earth? I had nothing to do with it. See what I mean? The world would say, well, they're just disciples of so-and-so. No, we're disciples of Christ. I was born again before I came to Temple Baptist Church. Amen. I was born again. 
baby, saved in 73 and came here in 76. Lord have mercy. I mean, what in the world? Could not save three years. Why well, seek you the living among the dead? He's not here, but is risen. Now watch this. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they remembered. So when did they remember? They remembered when the Holy Spirit through these angels uh, brought to life the things that they had been told. Have you ever been in a situation and scripture started to come to your mind you hadn't thought of in years and years and years? You ever had that happen? I have that happen all the time. It's, you know, like tonight, I can think, well, I want to think about this or think about this scripture or quote this or quote that, and I'm preaching this and that. That's all fine. But I have had in circumstances and situations that I was totally ignorant of, all of a sudden, this thing happens and scriptures just start pouring into my soul. You ever had that happen? Amen. That's what's happening here. He awakened them. He awakened them. And when he did, they remembered his words and returned from the sepulchre and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now watch this. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. Well, where's the apostles? <laughs> well, you remember the two that ran to the tomb? You remember who they were? Peter and John. Remember that? Peter and John. Peter came to, the, came to the door of the tomb. He stopped. John said, move right out of the way. He went right on in. The Bible says here, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and other women that were with them, which told these things to the apostles. Watch this. And their words seemed to them as idle tales. Hold it a minute. Now, wait a minute. You're the ones that sat by the fire. You're the ones that watched him raise Lazarus from the dead. Good night. You're the ones that saw him walking on the water. You're the ones that saw him drive demons out of people. You're the ones that saw him feed 5,000. And you think it's idle tales. Have you noticed the nature? Have you noticed their nature? Your nature and my nature? That's the old man. The old man has a tendency to disbelieve. That's natural. Huh. That's as natural as it can be. So how do you believe? You believe through the word of God. He quoted scripture to them. Did I not say? Well, if the Lord Jesus Christ said, did I not say, is that the word of God? <laughs> well, of course it is. And that, watch this, and their words seemed as idle tales, and they believed them not. My, what a thing. And then arose Peter and ran to the sepulcher. Stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Wait a minute, Peter. I give them the keys of the kingdom. Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, Barjona, flesh and blood hath not revealed that to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And yet Peter wonders in himself at that which was come to pass. See how it worked? These are real people, folks. That's why I'm saying all this tonight. These are not some kind of ethereal saints shining in glory with wings flying around everywhere, you know, and lived a privileged life in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Even though he died, was buried, and rose again the third day, they still sat there in unbelief. We've come a long way since then, haven't we? How do you think they felt when he walked through the wall and appeared in their midst? <laughs> All of a sudden, he just appeared. Door didn't open. He went right through the wall, and he appeared in their midst. Man, 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 boy, did it not change. And from after that and from that point on, these disciples were absolute. They were willing to give their life for the Lord Jesus, and most of them did. Andrew was crucified, tradition says, on a cross like this. Tradition says that Peter was crucified upside down, and so forth and so on. On it goes. These are traditions I'm giving you tonight. Uh, I don't know, we have, there's no record exactly how this happened, but we do know this. We do know that they gave their life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if they gave their life for him, we should, we should at least live for him, shouldn't we? 
Amen. And we may, we may, we may wind up giving our life for him. We don't know. I just say, even so come, Lord Jesus. I'll say this one thing before I close tonight. Something's been bothering me. And it's beginning to work on me day after day. We just came through a plague. And we're not through it. We're not through it. Plague's still here. But something's telling me something's coming. And it's going to be related to homosexuality and sodomy. We had GRID that showed up about 30 years ago. Gay-related immune deficiency. Okay? Well, it wasn't long after that before they realized that this was too definitive, so they changed it to AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency. And you see, this month is Gay Pride Month. This is Gay Pride Month. It is far worse this year than it was last year. What makes you think it'll be any, any better next year? America has already made its choice. It's made its choice. And it's headed down. It's headed down. And I can't help but believe sometimes God is so gracious and merciful that it gives people an opportunity and warning to get right with God. And they're watching people drop dead all around them. It's not as bad as it was, but they're watching it. What makes you think that God Almighty could not bring another judgment and plague down on this place? Amen. Remember what I said about France? Remember? Have you heard that recently from your government? Go uh, Google it. Check it out. Remember, check France and then check America and see which is headed in which direction. Father, bless this word tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, folks, I will meet you. We'll see you Sunday morning.